This edition of Mac Voices is sponsored by Linode, your solution when you need a virtual server in the cloud. Use the code MACVOICES2019 to take $20 off your first purchase at linode.com slash macvoices. Welcome back to Mac Voices. This is the talk of the Apple community, and I'm Chuck Joyner. Folks, we're headed down the road to Mac OS Catalina coming quite soon now. And that means a lot of us are going to have to make a choice between upgrading uh, to Catalina and losing some of our 32-bit apps or converting over and just suffering through the transition. Or maybe we don't. Um, joining me this time is Michael Roy, the product manager for VMware Fusion, among other products, to talk about how virtualization might solve a little bit of our dilemma. Michael, welcome. It's great to have you. Well, thanks, Chuck. Happy to be here. I am delighted. I am delighted. Um, I, I talked to a developer in an earlier version of Mac Voices, and we had a little discussion about could virtualization solve some of our problems? And the answer was yes. And so I thought, let's get you on and talk about the latest version of VMware Fusion and just what it can do for us with, with the impending big change we're all facing. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Um, and, and that's, that's correct. Virtualization can absolutely help with this. Um, you know, it's not a panacea that can certainly solve everything and it's not without its technical quirks, uh, but absolutely. That's the whole point. Um, the, the underlying premise of virtualization is a, is the concept of abstraction. So you have your hardware and then above your hardware, we have our layer. So the virtualization layer, and that allows you to sort of move operating systems independent of the hardware. So Taking the or separating the two, the operating system from the hardware, uh, means you don't have to have like a you know necessarily a one to one relationship. So, for example, if Apple's new hardware requires sixty four bit and you have a thirty two bit app, what do you do? Well, that abstraction layer is designed uh, to kind of help out in this situation like that. Okay, so that that sounds good, and I. I don't want to go too technical, but first of all, it's something obvious that VMware Fusion itself, the product, has to be a 64-bit app. Absolutely. Um, not only the the front end of the app, but all of the sub little components that you know make it all work on the back end have to be 64-bit as well. Okay. So is is VMware Fusion actually create? I know we talk a lot about virtual machines. Is it creating a virtual Macintosh in this case as we, since we're going to be installing, um, say, Mojave or something earlier into it? I mean, how is that, how is it reconciling the 32 bit versus 64? Yeah, well, it's part of the abstraction. So we run a virtual machine, which to the operating system looks just like a physical machine, slightly different. So instead of seeing like, you know, Apple motherboard, it sees like VMware motherboard, but it works the same way. So because of that encapsulation, you know, we are running a 64-bit host. All of our apps are 64-bit. But with inside of a any virtual machine, we have control to be able to do whatever we want. We can run 16-bit MS-DOS in a virtual machine if we so choose. Um, and then in this version, we actually also added Sound Blaster 16 support. So you can play Doom in a MS-DOS window on your 64-bit Mac just happily. Okay, and I think I just got it, and I, I really appreciate that explanation because I've never heard it stated quite that way before. This is no different than I have a MacBook Pro right now. I can run my 32-bit OS on it. In a, in a just a short time, I'll be able to run a 64-bit OS on it. I don't change the hardware. It's, it's the software that is changing. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, so it's in, also in... It uses some of the components of the CPU, right? So you wouldn't be able to, for example, run a 64-bit operating system on a 32-bit CPU. You'd need, you know, uh, you know, a 64-bit CPU with a 32-bit operating system or a 64-bit operating system. The CPU has to be bigger. But within that, you have a lot more control uh, and we have a lot more flexibility because of that abstraction that we're doing. You know, we're, we're pretending that we have some actual hardware. And when we do that pretending, we can mask things, we can hide things, and we can show things that actually aren't even there. So, for example, the video card. The video card that runs inside of an operating system is not a real video card. But to the operating system, it looks just like it and it works just like it. There's drivers, there's what it thinks is hardware. Um, and what, so you could even, for example, 
have a 32-bit operating system on assuming a 64-bit chip, which, you know, every chip that's been made since 2011 has been fully 64-bit. Um, you could run a newer version of Mac OS as a virtual machine and test out like Catalina on, say, you know, Snow Leopard or, or something to that effect. Uh, and it goes both ways. So you can run the newest version of the operating system on the Mac itself and then have older operating systems or different operating systems, so Windows or Linux, have those as virtual machines and each of them can be different versions and there's a lot of other interesting things that we can do to them once they are in virtual machine format and likewise if you have an older one you can run newer stuff in a virtual machine in order to test it and make sure that it's going to work before going ahead and deploying it on physical machines so i think i already know the answer to this but i'll ask it for the sake of everyone so why aren't we all running virtual machines and not having to worry about some of this stuff yeah, it's a good question. I'd love everybody to run virtual machines, of course. Um, you know, there's a few things I think that go along with that. So previously, um, you know, virtual machines were slow and it was cumbersome to run two operating systems on the same computer at the same time, particularly with, you know, the majority of consumer hardware. It wasn't quite up to the task for doing it effectively. The main bottleneck was around the storage. So having the spindle hard drives um, the old school drives, they they take a lot more time to to read and write. And when you're running two operating systems at the same time, that really becomes noticeable when you're trying to do even just basic things. So up until only kind of recently, when now solid state drives are the standard, um, running a lot of desktops is just for the heck of it. Well, it wasn't something that folks were doing because of the performance issue, you know. But now with solid state drives, multi-core machines, and lots of RAM. Um, that becomes a non-issue. So you can, most MacBook Pros, they, you know, you got 16 or 32 gigs of RAM on them. The machine I'm using right now is six cores, which is 12 threads, a, you know, 32 gigs of RAM and a terabyte of storage on a solid state. So that's like way more than I need to run anything. So I can run a whole bunch of little things inside of it and it performs as near native as, you know, there's only a few exceptions where you really would notice the performance, but Hardware got so good over the past couple of years that it just makes sense, you know, for depending on what you're doing. So, like, for example, at home, I have some virtual machines that I use specifically for browsing the web anonymously. I have other virtual machines that I use that will be Linux that have development environments inside of them, different types of code, different versions of things I'm working on. Um, other uh, VMs I'll have will be Windows, and maybe I have some old games. You know, I really like Age of Empires, so I have a VM that's got some old school games on it. Um, so there's a lot of use cases here, but what's amazing is that because hardware has gotten so good over the past bunch of years, you can run them side by side, and it's seamless. You know, I could put Windows in full screen and drive it, and if you didn't know that I was on a Macintosh, you probably wouldn't be able to tell just from looking at Windows itself. So I think there are probably a couple types of programs that don't don't really fit this bill. Of I would think the video rendering would be a bit of an issue because that's always looking for CPU. Um, maybe some photo things, maybe definitely some games. Uh, are, are those all correct statements? Um, sort of. So we made some pretty good progress in this department. Um, we're not 100% there in terms of parity or, uh, and, and near native speed when it comes to 3D graphics. Because uh, there's a bit of a trick that we have to do with when it comes to graphics. When it comes to CPU, Intel makes an AMD, um, in particular Intel, make it easy for us to sort of bypass the operating system and talk directly to that CPU. And that CPU has special instructions in it that know how to split the two worlds. So here's the Mac and here's Windows, and it can you know schedule all the instructions one at a time just fine. Uh, but a GPU doesn't do that. A graphics card doesn't have that physical capability. So we have to actually present to the operating system a fake one. And that's our VMware you know, driver and, and, and associated virtual hardware. Now, that's actually pretty good. We have DirectX 10.1 shipping right now. Um, it uses Apple's metal rendering engine on the host. So, you know, Apple has... There previously there was OpenGL and now there's Apple's proprietary metal technology. So we actually use metal to create graphics inside of virtual machines, whether that's with um, OpenGL for Linux VMs or uh, DirectX 10 for Windows VMs. And with that, um, performance is actually pretty good. Uh, there are some limitations, of course. 
like if you need DirectX 11 and it doesn't have a DirectX 10 fallback, it's not going to work. If you need something that has DirectX 12, it's not going to work. If you have an app that is incredibly graphically intense, you know, like Crisis, for example, so the video game, um, that's going to have a hard time running on it. But like one of our primary use cases is folks that actually use AutoCAD and other types of uh, 3D CAD applications that, you know, only have a Windows component or maybe they're licensed differently on Windows versus Mac and you've got a Windows license from, you know, back in the day or whatever. Um, those work great. We use those as per, sort of our, our primary focus to make sure that if this runs good, then we can assume a lot of other stuff's going to run good as well. So it's pretty much our, ki- our primary test matrix. Okay, so a couple of specific use cases I wanted to, to talk a little bit about. Um, one of the reasons I hear that a lot of people run old OS uh, operating system versions is that a, a particular piece of hardware and, and, and then drivers are only written for that OS and they've never been updated. Maybe a printer, maybe a scanner, maybe you know a, a die cutting machine, you know, a lot of things like that. So how, how well is the, the I.O. for the virtual machines and to, as a way to solve those problems? Oh, great question. That's actually also one of our, our really popular use cases. Um, there are you know, other hypervisors and whatnot, but they're not necessarily going to try and solve for some of these use cases. Um, so, for example, you have a serial bus adapter that is goes to USB, and maybe there's some peripheral on the other side that only speaks the serial bus. We can actually take that device and bypass the operating system that you're on and give that to a virtual machine completely. So, you know, a, a popular use case from, you know, so I've been with VMware for about 10 years. And when I started at VMware, I was in the support organization running the Fusion and Workstation support team. And it was interesting the number of customers that came in that are trying to get a sewing machine to work. So as an example, right, uh, it's this really old thing. It has a serial port adapter on it, and there's some software that only runs in Windows 98, and uh, it's for doing like embroidery or uh, like patterns and things like that. And so you have to give that, you can't run that on Mac, you can't run that on newer versions of Windows, what do you do? Uh, and that's really where the virtual machine comes in. There are, uh, you know, so this is great for maintaining older hardware too. So for example, there are there's a certain special kingdom somewhere in Southern California, uh, amusement park place, and you can imagine the software that drives a roller coaster, or something like that, right? It's not always going to be up to date. So when it gets built, it's built so that it makes the roller coaster run, and then it's done, and it gets put onto the hardware, and there it sits. Well, if something goes wrong with that, how are you going to fix it? You know, so a solution to fix that is to use a virtual machine with the version of the, you know, the debugging software that was designed to work with that hardware. And, you know, you can pass the device directly into that VM and then work with it as if you're running around with a, you know, DOS 3.1 laptop, uh, just the same, right? <laughs> so you'd be, it's, a, it's, it's kind of amazing the number of devices uh, that, you know, when you build a device and you invest a whole ton of R&D into it, it's not something that you want to just like throw away every couple of years because technology is more interesting. So you need to have this sort of continuity and, and virtualization is a great way to make sure that all the old stuff, whether it's hardware or software can continue to live in today's world. I, I admit, I never thought of a roller coaster, a sewing machine. Sure. A roller coaster. No, I hadn't thought about that particular use yeah. case. As- assembly lines, car manufacturing, like it, the list is just incredible. So you do you support SCSI? Yeah. Oh my God, I was joking. <laughs> no, we do. Uh, we actually, really? the, the by default, the device that you when you create a, a virtual machine, the d- the disk driver default type is SCSI uh, because the protocol has a lot less overhead and it's more performant um, on spindle drives. If you have a you know modern Mac, you want to use the NVMe, the you know the SSD option, but but by default, it's SCSI. It's probably the first time first time that the word SCSI has been used on this program in about five years. So <laughs> you never know. Okay, so the other, the other question that we just have to ask everybody right now, it seems like no matter who I talk to, we have to ask about the issue of security and privacy. If I'm running a virtual machine, am I still subject to the same needs 
of security for that virtual machine and and how much trouble is it? Because it's, sometimes it feels like we all have trouble enough just trying to keep our, our main machines uh, secure, let alone having a, four or five virtual machines hanging around in there. Sure, that's a great question. Um, so there's the one thing about the virtual hardware is that it actually is a security barrier. So the one thing about, you know, one of the interesting things about Fusion and how it is, how it came to be, um, is that it's, it is a fork or a port of ESX. Now, ESX, you know, VMware, we're a you know, $10 billion company. Uh, our bread and butter is in the data center. What we did was in order to create that data center software, we had to start with a single piece of software on, you know, one, one computer. And that is what was called Workstation. Now, Fusion and Workstation are essentially the same. Workstation runs on Windows and Linux, and Fusion runs on Mac. But it's basically the same hypervisor code, which is the same hypervisor code we put into the data center. So it's, you know, by default, we are we have requirements because of who we sell to and the pervasity of our, of our stack to make sure that that barrier is very, very locked down. So by default, it's very, very difficult, if not impossible, to actually run a code inside of the virtual machine and have it like jump out and do something bad on the host. So it's a great way to um, test, for example, malware. You have a lot of companies, you know, that may be installed on your computers right now that use VMware, whether it's Fusion or Workstation, um, to take, like, for example, a virtual machine that has uh, a virus in it. You know, you can actually take a physical machine and clone it and create a virtual machine from it. So security forensic professionals actually do that, bring the virtual machine over onto a Mac or, you know, in a case of Windows or Linux, a workstation machine, and run their analysis tools inside of it, knowing that that whatever bad is happening inside of that virtual machine can't get out and can't disrupt the host. Um, so if you actually take like the SAMS Institute, any of their security training, the first step that they they go through is install workstation. Um, so it's it's bread and butter is, you know, how that layer of isolation protects um, and can be used both proactively, but also if you are running virtual machines on a very regular basis, doing like day-to-day stuff, you have the ability to actually snapshot. And what that means is we can take a VM and like point in time, like make a save point and revert back to that at any point. So it's handy if you're going to be doing something that you might not be sure is going to be cool. Um, You can take a snapshot, do the thing, and if everything's great, cool. And if not, you can roll back to that snapshot before, you know, whatever went wrong. So not only does it have that barrier, security professionals use it because of that barrier, but it also has controls within it that in case you do get compromised, you can roll back. Okay, so just to be clear here, if I create a virtual machine on my Mac that is running with just say um, High Sierra, and High Sierra gets infected uh, or or compromised in some fashion, that's not that stays within that virtual machine. It doesn't get out to the the, the Macintosh that I'm sitting in front of, or the operating system of that Macintosh. It's just contained in that virtual machine. That's exactly correct. There's actually a contest that uh, a couple of them that happen around the world every year, um, you know, pwn to own hacking type of contests. And what they do is um, they have prizes for breaking things and, you know, escaping, uh, you know, code where you're not supposed to, you know, generally it's browsers and whatnot. But a couple of years ago, they added Workstation and Fusion to the list um, and with a $100,000 bounty. So if you can, which is the most, the biggest bounty they've ever given to software. So if you can actually prove that you can write code that can jump out of the guest and do something on the host, uh, not only are you the only one that can do it, you've got a hundred thousand dollar check waiting for you. So yeah, we stand by it as being you know pretty much the most secure in the industry. Linode.com/slash/MacVoices is where you want to go if you need a virtual hosted cloud server. Why is Linode so great? Because that's what Linode specializes in. They feature native SSD storage, a forty gigabit network and industry-leading processors so that your server is FAST fast. Because you pay for only what you use, with hourly billing across all plans and add-on services, no extra charges for data transfer, no hidden fees or nasty surprises at the end of the month. Because Linode has a new cloud manager with an improved user interface, so deploying your server or servers is easier than ever. 
Because Linode has data centers around the world, including one just launched in Toronto and one opening soon in Mumbai. So if location matters, Linode has it covered because they have a large documentation library to help you get started and help you make the most of your server. Because Linode has 24-7 live customer support, so if you get stuck or have issues, help is just a phone call away. Because Linode has a ton of add-ons, so that you can customize your server with exactly what you want and what you need. Backups, blocks, node balancers, load balancers, and much more. So what do you need to take advantage of all this? Visit linode.com slash macvoices to get set up and to get $20 credit towards your first server. Again, linode.com slash macvoices gets you $20 off your first server. Check it out now and be up and running in minutes. Thanks to Linode for their support of Mac Voices. What else should I know about this? I'm sure there are, there are a dozen other questions that we could, we could get to, but um, what else do I need to know about this, and especially in relation to solving the 32-bit, 64-bit problem? Yeah, well, you know, the nice thing about virtualization, like I said, it provides you this abstraction. The tricky thing is, is it, it becomes tricky when you talk about, like, what do they do with it? Well, you know, because we have so many different types of users who have so many different use cases for the products. Like I said, if you're a developer, you might want to run either a desktop or some server. If you're testing stuff, you might want to test on different versions of different browsers on different operating systems, right? To make sure your app or your web service is going to work. Um, so, Or, you know, Mac admins, for example, use this pretty heavily in order to test device enrollment. So you can verify like, hey, like I had this depth script and it can work just fine with my Mac deployment. I can verify that in a virtual machine. And then, you know, when I'm ready to, I can go ahead and deploy that same script to my physical machines and it's going to do the device enrollment just as part of, uh, you know, the regular Apple rollout. So, you know, there's a, there's a, a very wide range of stuff that we can do with hypervisor. And now because they're so performant, uh, that is more accessible for everybody. Um, you know, and we've been iterating and, and doing a lot of great stuff to improve this process over the years, you know, so like I mentioned earlier, we added uh, metal support so that the graphics rendering engine is a lot more performant. So you can do things like 3D games and, and things like that. Uh, we've been improving the security. So making sure that we have, you know, mitigations for things like Spectre and Meltdown and all those fun things that came over um, earlier in the year. Um, in addition, you know, with the most recent version of Fusion, of course, we're supporting Catalina. And one of the cool things about Catalina um, is this feature called Sidecar. Have you heard of? I'm sure you guys have talked, probably talked about it on the show, right? Oh, sure. Yeah, we're yeah, all so looking forward to it. It's very cool. You know, I've been testing it for for a bunch of weeks, and, um, and the neat thing about it is, is, you know, with Fusion, it works great. So we can actually take your iPad and put. Uh, windows in full screen on it and you can control it with like the pencil um, and it's just as if it were a secondary display so the ability to have like uh, you know your mac right here and then you got an ipad right beside you and the ipad's running windows um, it's kind of incredible and it can do it all wirelessly um, so apple's been making some pretty great strides and it's a lot of effort to keep up with that uh, but we've been I think, you know, on the curve of it, and we have a really great working relationship, both with Apple as well as Microsoft, making sure that, you know, we're going to keep things supported. We're going to support all the great next generation of technology, but also make sure that we don't break the old stuff. Because like you said, keeping the lights on and making sure that some of the old, or old older applications are going to run, even if the newer hardware doesn't support it or the new operating system doesn't support it, I mean, is, is pretty important for us. You know, business continuity is sort of what helps VMware got to where it is. So having that ability is just, you know, table stakes as far as we're concerned. Keeping in mind that the, that newer is always faster, how fast a machine or how new a machine do we need to, to be able to run? I know you're refer referencing metal and a lot of the new technologies here. How far back can some, someone, <coughs> excuse me, how far back can someone run a virtual machine effectively? Yeah, I would say, you know, I wouldn't go further than 2011 or 2012, depending on the specific hardware. Um, and the reason for that is there was a, a, a generational shift in processors that happened around that time, um, which is to say that, you know, Nahalem was the version of Intel's generation that this was, was done in. And there's some new features inside of the CPU that um, aid virtualization in an incredible way. We had to do this, like, really long code path, if you will, uh, before that. 
And after Intel introduced this new platform, uh, we adopted it. And over the past couple of years, we've actually deprecated support for stuff older than that. So an older machine from like 2010 uh, will not run a newer version of, of VMware. But uh, anything from basically the, 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 I, the Mac Pro from around then and onward, um, everything will be just fine. On the Windows side, it's a little different. So like Nahalem, the particular generation wasn't all that popular. So most computers nowadays are, are pretty good. Anything, like I said, built in the past eight years should be just fine. Um, and if there's older technology, you know, we do make available our older versions, which still support that. So if there's a need, for example, in Africa, we support um, a bunch of nonprofits through a group in San Francisco called TechSoup. And we provide them special licensing and special discounts on licensing so that they can you know, have workstation and have whatever installed on their, their, their devices. And these things are generally not newer. They kind of inherit them as part of companies as they do their upgrade cycles, right? And they're, or they're donated and things like that. So, you know, we make sure that things continue to run for them as well. And uh, it's, it's, it's always a cat and mouse thing too, because, you know, there's a lot of benefit that we get by using the newer technology. And it's very painful and difficult to support a lot of the old stuff. Um, but at the same time, it's really important to us. So we still make these things available. One other question I wanted to ask, because I know a lot of us are struggling with, no, not struggling, that's not quite fair, but the, our big hard drives are now small, relatively small SSDs or comparatively small. Um, I've, I realize that you re- referenced SSDs before we have Thunderbolt on newer Macs. Is it possible or is it effective to run a VM off of, say, an SSD attached by USB-C, or USB-3, excuse me, or Thunderbolt? Definitely. Um, so, you know, I, I've done both of those. Um, they both were great. It was t- trickier, you know, with USB 2 um, and and in particular with spindle hard drives. Again, you're, you're, the spindle hard drive only goes so fast, and then you're even further throttling that with USB 2. Uh, but USB 3, the bandwidth is much bigger. So if your hard drive can support it, yeah, actually. So it's um, it makes for a really portable use case. So I can take a virtual machine, plug it into my Mac, on an SSD drive with Thunderbolt 3 or USB-C and run everything from there, power it down, unplug it, walk over to my PC, plug it in, run it, and it'll just continue to run like no problem, right? Because Workstation and Fusion are the same code. So it'll, you know, the, the VMs of themselves are transferable. Wow, I would not have, th- I've, I would have thought moving Mac to Mac, I would not have thought about moving a, a virtual machine from Mac to PC and back. Yeah, the only the only hang up there is uh, around Apple's license model. So Apple licenses their operating system to run only on their own hardware. So you're not actually able to run Mac OS in a virtual machine on Windows. Uh, we explicitly block block that. Um, but that being said, you know anything else is very portable. Interesting. Yeah, and some um, customers, what they do is actually they'll install our data center software, so ESX and vSphere, on top of Mac Minis to do things like continuous integration with iOS. So you have like a a continuous iOS build farm running on a bunch of Mac minis that have VMware installed on it. So we talked about this before the show. Can you show us a little bit of this and what it looks like? Yeah, sure. Um, Let me, I guess, just kind of share a little bit of detail first, and then we can get into some demo. Go for it. So, you know, when we look at sort of what we do, you know, at the end of the day, we run stuff on top of an operating system. You know, you have your host OS on Mac, Windows, or Linux. You know, Mac is Fusion, Windows and Linux is Workstation. And we have this like virtual layer. Um, and then on top of the virtual layer, we can do all this great stuff, you know. So sometimes those virtual machines are desktops. Sometimes um, some professionals will actually run a full software data center as a bunch of VMs. Uh, in a way, to, as a way to learn, we, we we're also starting to experiment and do some pretty cool things around Kubernetes, which is this cloud awesomeness for orchestrating containers uh, and being able also to run just containers natively. You know, so we uh, we just shipped actually last week. Um, so we released eleven point five, which is a free upgrade for eleven point X customers. So if you bought version eleven. And you get a pop-up notification. Um, you don't have to go to the store. You can just download it and install it. Your key will continue to work. 
And this will be supported until, you know, for another 18 month release cycle. So it's not like we're just going to cut support and release another version. This is a longer term support model. And with that, you know, we introduced a bunch of great features um, that I'll show you here. So, you know, every release, we always have to make sure that we're supporting the next version of all the operating systems that are coming out. So we've got Catalina, both host and guest. Host meaning the Catalina will, Fusion will run on a Mac that has Catalina. And uh, for guest, meaning you can run a virtual machine that has Catalina on it, that doesn't have to be on a Catalina host. You could do it on an older host, uh, but <clears throat> that'll work. Uh, a highly requested feature was uh, dark mode. So the ability to, when the Mac is running in dark mode, have Fusion also respect that and change its UI accordingly. Um, and I mentioned also Sidecar. So this will come when 1015 drops. We've been using it in the betas and it's working pretty good. Uh, the ability to drive your iPad directly from your, um, or sorry, drive Windows directly from your iPad. Um, and for some of the, you know, more folks that do more cloud stuff, we've been adding a lot of controls there. So we're really focused on like developers, IT administrators, and, and folks that are living in this cloud world and less on, you know, like I want to play a video game, right? So that's an interesting use case. And, and we make sure that our 3D graphics stack is really important. But when we innovate, we try to think about how we can make the builders' lives better and the the uh, IT administrators' lives a little better. So that's why we added jumbo frames, for example, the ability to set your uh, networking virtual networking stack to have extra large packets, which helps when you're doing um, a variety of things that are pretty esoteric. You know, like running software defined data center, you need larger packets, and you know, there's a, a way that we can now control that. Um, we've also added, uh, we mentioned the SCSI device, so there's a pair of virtual SCSI device. Um, and that makes it very portable with ESX. So we can migrate virtual machines from the data center onto the desktop and back now because we have full hardware compatibility. So what that means is like I can create on my Mac a virtual machine that has a particular set of configurations. I can actually connect my virtual or fusion to my data center and like drag and drop a VM from my desktop into the data center. So it's great for, you know, you're building some app, you can just, you know, migrate the, into the data center, it'll just work. Um, and we're also doing cool things around Kubernetes. So the ability to run Docker um, using our hypervisor um, is a very interesting thing. So uh, have you been talking about containers and things like that in your show at all, Jeff? We've talked, we've touched a little bit on it when we did some interviews at WWDC, um, but not in a, in great detail. All right, cool. That's good enough. So. <clears throat> you know, Docker needs Linux. In order for a container to run, the whole way that containers work is that there's Linux there. And Linux has this special stuff that it does at the kernel level to isolate things. Now, I mentioned before how a virtual machine is like a barrier, a security barrier and an isolation barrier. Um, a Docker container, that isolation barrier is not a security barrier. Um, it's a sort of, it's a barrier, but it's not the same as a, as a virtual machine because um, you're running them all on the same kernel, the same process. So we actually, you know, with Docker, when it runs, it actually spins up a virtual machine and it does it, you know, a variety of ways. And what we've done is we've inserted a special driver that allows it to talk to our hypervisor to deploy containers and, and, uh, and Kubernetes and things like that. You know, so like how that looks is, you know, you run some command, it talks to this Docker machine thing, it, the driver then talks to Fusion, and then Infusion can go ahead and spin up the containers and whatnot. So it's a nice way to sort of like experiment and, 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 and build things that are going to be cloud native, um, as opposed to just having to like, well, I need a Linux computer uh, in order to do that. This kind of gives you that, that control uh, without necessarily having to use, you know, or install Docker itself. So I'll show you Fusion right here. So this is our library window where it all kind of begins. And uh, I'll fire this up and just kind of put it over here so it can get going for us. But, you know, so while I'm firing that up, um, this is where our library is. So within the library, I've created some folders here and inside of those folders, I have a variety of virtual machines. So we'll, we'll fire on my, uh, this is a Mac OS Catalina virtual machine and so if I, you can show you here where right now i'm actually on mojave 1014 but in the virtual machine here you'll see that i'm actually using uh, catalina whatever version of the beta that it was at the time it's uh yeah see it's even older than that <laughs> nice 
um, wrong, wrong beta, <laughs> but in any case, um, <laughs> <laughs> different machine, my bad. Um, but in any case, same, same process, right? Like this, this could be anything, right? So, you know, we can do some pretty interesting things like, Hey, let's, you know, make sure the virtual machine is this particular size and dimension and, uh, and it'll work just that way. Right. We, um, we also added a feature to support, um, dark mode here. So I'll turn that on and I hope this works. Might not. Let's find out. I like to do things without a net. So if we go into our system preferences and we pull up general, we see we have light and dark. I'm on light mode right now. And if I switch that to dark mode, you see fusion, you know, now it gets all nice and dark and looks great. Um, and if I switch it back, is it going to trigger? No, it didn't trigger it. Um, you see it switched here, but it's supposed to also trigger the, the guest. I was not prepared. <laughs> my, my demos didn't work. But in any case, um, it will change the guest layout and or change the guest UI to uh, to match and to synchronize. And we're also going to support that in Windows. As Windows now is going to have dark mode and light mode. We're going to be able to keep those in sync as well. So I can just suspend this here. So what I'm doing is I'm like actually pausing this virtual machine. So it's now suspended, which means that um, it's not running. The CPU process has gone away. Um, but the VM is like saved in this state. So I can close it. I can, you know, quit all this stuff. And when I come back to it, you know, it's going to be just there um, as it right where I left it. So I can resume it. It'll take a moment, loads it, everything back into RAM. And then, you know, bam, we're off to the races, you know. So let's just spend that. Windows in the meantime is deciding to update itself over here. Um, <laughs> of course. Just <laughs> <which is, which laughs> as, as it does. Right, um, but yeah, Windows is basically our primary our primary use case. So thankfully, that happened without too much pain. While that's firing up, I'll also show you the snapshots. So I mentioned we have the ability to to roll back and do things like that. So we could, for example. Um, take a pause. So right now, this is the current state, and I can say, "Hey, go ahead and you know take a snapshot." So we can save this state, and we can go back to it later. We'll say, "Go ahead, take a snapshot." Yes. Anyway, okay, cool. So now it's got this snapshot. So now, if I go ahead and like, you know, I don't know do stuff, um, and you know, so it's like updating things right now, and I'm like, eh, maybe I don't want it to do that. What I can do is I can pause the virtual machine or suspend it. Say, okay, there it goes. And now what I can do is I can roll back. So this is like right now, you can see that it looks just like it does over here, but I wanna roll back. So we hit this button, say, don't save the current snapshot. I can save the current state as another snapshot so I can go back to before I went back. Uh, but otherwise we can just save here. Didn't want to do that. Store it, don't save it. <clears throat> now what it's gonna do is you're probably gonna see it actually spin up the same windows that it did just a moment ago. So if I say cancel this, I think a bunch of scripts are gonna start running over here. So there you go. So it's like I rolled back in time, just like a few minutes. And, you know, now it's exactly where it was when I did that. And you rolled back in time. That's, that's very interesting. You rolled back in time to a point when it was doing updates. Yeah. So, yeah. We can do all this stuff on the fly. It's kind of crowded, kind of crazy. Yeah. That, I mean, that's something that I think most of us would be, you know, okay. If the machine is updating itself hands off until it finishes and then we'll start playing and you just did it, you know, right in the middle yeah i've definitely done it where like windows i want to shut it down and windows is like hey like, hold on let me do all my updates and it gives you that green screen with the one thing in the middle that's like don't turn me off um yeah i just hit the pause i just hit the suspend button close it go to work open it up open it it just finishes you know hmm. 
pretty now, how much I, I realize that that it depends on what you're going to do with a virtual machine as as to how much storage you need to have in the vir- inside that virtual machine and all. But can you give us a rough idea or gu- any kind of guidelines as to what how much space a virtual machine will take up? Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely it depends. Um, but you know what we have is on the library window. If you look here on the bottom, it gives you a bit of a snapshot of you know the snapshot. <laughs> Um, So you can see, like, I'm spending about 85 gigs um, in Windows here. Got a lot of apps and stuff installed. Um, uh, 16 gigs of that is saved in the snapshot state that we took. And the reason it's 16 gigs is there's, it it takes us uh, an exact duplicate of the current memory state. So you see I've got, like, 8 gigs allocated here. Um, So it's going to save, like, 8 gigs and then plus the swap file, which is, like, another 8 gigs. So, you know, it saves that per snapshot. If I had like three or four snapshots, they're probably going to be roughly about the same size each. Um, so, you know, by default, we give some some guidance. But the interesting thing is the VM itself doesn't actually consume all the space that you give it until it needs to. So I can right click and I can say show and finder here. And if you look at, so, you know, we add it all up, you know, I'm looking at about 130 gigs um, for this virtual machine here. But if we take a look at the Mac one, this will be a little different. So if I look at what we've configured for the drive, we've configured 40 gigs for the Mac OS virtual machine drive. So it can grow up to that, but it won't use that until the space actually starts needing it, until the operating system, the guest operating system starts asking for that. So if we look at how big that file is, you know, you can see it's about 18 gigs there. So... I just do the same thing, show and finder, um, you know, with the memory state and everything else that's in it, ends up being about 28 gigs. So, you know, we've configured it for 40. It, it's a maximum is going to use 40 plus however much RAM and then a little bit on top of that. Um, there's definitely scenarios and, and problems if you don't have enough hard drive space. So you need to make sure that you save a fairly decent amount of space available on your system. Uh, so that the VM has enough room to do its operations. Like it kind of grows and shrinks as it needs to. And if it doesn't have enough space to do that, um, it's going to have a hard time. You know, if it's got nowhere on the physical computer to write the memory files or the disk files, it's not going to be able to save them anywhere. So it's just going to fail. So um, we do a check for that. And it's like, hey, like you're running low on space. Like make sure that you free up X amount of gigabytes so that we can you know, run smoothly. Um, and my kind of rule of thumb on that is you want to leave yourself, you know, 15% of your disk free. So, you know, on a 200 gig, um, you know, I've got about 200 gigs left. This is a terabyte hard drive. Um, I don't like getting closer than this. You know, this is, this is kind of where I, where I, you know, my sweet spot in terms of how big my VMs get with how much space I want to leave on the machine. So, so with- Windows VMs tend to be bigger too. So, so with APFS and some of the changes there that we're all, frankly, still getting used to, I, I still need to assign a space, a, a designated amount of space for my virtual machine, a maximum designated space for my virtual machine when I go and create it. Is that correct? That's right. So if we create one here, we just say new. Um, <clears throat> right now with APFS, um, we have a bit of a feature gap where we can't actually read the uh, recovery partition if the system is in APFS. We're going to be addressing that in an update. But otherwise, if you have uh, HFS or the older Mac, you can actually create a Mac partition or a Mac, a Mac VM from the installation partition. Um, but we'll just install from the image just to give you kind of a look here. Uh, again, ISOs. Of course not. In any case, I can just make a custom one. That's fine. Because what I want to show you is the config anyway. So by default, what it would do is when you drag an installation medium on here, it will detect that automatically. Um, in this case, I'm just making one, and then I can install the operating system later. So just to show you, so we'll take Mac OS, let's say, I don't know, 10.10. That was a nice release. Um, we can then 
either create a new virtual hard disk or if you have an old one, if you've made a VM before and you want and like something went wrong, you can take the, the, the virtual hard drive and put it into a new V and into a new virtual machine. It'll just keep working. Um, so we'll just say make a new one. And then it gives us a bit of a summary. So by default, we pick some options for you. So Mac, you know, 40 gigs, two gigs of RAM and uh, two CPU cores is what we allocate. So we'll say, okay, customize it. We have to save it somewhere. Uh, by default, we put it into your documents virtual machines folder, or say just into your, your home virtual machine folder. And once it's there, so now we get the settings. So this is where we can control things like, you know, all the disk options and whatever. So I can take that 40 gig and we can grow it to, you know, however much we want, you know, just say, 50 is a fine number, apply, cool. Uh, and this is where also we can change the, the disk type. So if we want it to go, um, you know, SCSI, we can just pick the SCSI drive here. Um, Mac OS 10.10 doesn't know what an NVMe device is, so it's not an option for us, but on newer versions of whatever, that'll, that, that shows up. Um, and then we have the ability to do these options here, which is to either pre-allocate, which means to, when I create this file, which is virtual disk.vmdk, virtual machine disk, um, it will actually eat all of that 50 gigs right off the bat. That way, like you guaranteed it's not going to get bigger than that. Um, and it's got all of that space in like one chunk. Um, and then that, that'll be just in one file. And then we also have the option to split that into multiple files. That becomes handy when you want to move the virtual machine around. If you have an older like FAT32 hard drive, those drives can't read files that are bigger than like 3.7, 3.8 gigs. So we can split them into two gigabyte chunks, and then you can pass those VMs around just fine. It looks like it's one big file, but um, they're actually all independent little ones. And then you have options to configure everything else too. So for example, all the CPU cores, I have six cores with hyper threading. So it detects that I have 12 available cores to give to the virtual machine. Now 12 is like too much. Um, I wouldn't, my general rule of thumb is you want to leave yourself with enough uh, resources on the host to do what the host does. So in this case, you know, I have a six core machine. I generally wouldn't give myself more than, uh, I wouldn't spend more than 10 cores. And that's a lot of resources. You know, for most VMs, two cores is going to be fine. I generally don't go more than four on a, on a system. Um, and the same thing with memory. So, you know, we can, you make something appropriate here. Generally, between four and eight gigs is all right. Um, four gigs is pretty standard. Eight gigs is a little more performant. Um, the drawback there is if you, the bigger you make the memory, the more time it will take to suspend it because it has to read all that memory and then write it to disk. So the bigger the memory, the more time it's going to spend uh, writing all of that to disk. Um, you know, and then we have the option as well to accelerate 3D graphics. And when we accelerate 3D graphics, we can um, specify how big of a graphics adapter that the operating system thinks it's going to have. So we can give it up to three gigabytes of, of memory. And then we also have the ability to uh, either fake the resolution so that it thinks it's in a smaller window and we stretch it, or we give it all of the pixels so that it draws them all one to one. And, uh, you know, the net net is like you can see in Windows here, um, it's all pretty small. If I resume it and and do what it was wanting to do, which is log out and log back in, it would resize all the icons to like 2x. It thinks it's on like a high definition display and it will just, you know, adjust things accordingly. Um, just fine there. But yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing that what we can do given the level of abstraction you know, um, in the pro product as well, we have some some more controls um, over, for example, the virtual network. So we can do crazy things like um, we can configure. Let me actually this up. Uh, we can configure things like um, network uh, bandwidth limits. So if I take go back to this virtual machine here and we go into the network adapter. Um, what we can do here is we can throttle. So we can make it look like your VM is actually, you know, somewhere on a, you know, on a modem. 
um, or on a you know four megabit cable connection or, or whatever. And this is really great for testing apps resiliency. So if you have some web service or some thing you want to hit, and you're like, how good does it work if I'm like you know in the middle of the jungle? You can simulate that kind of stuff, or even like drop packets. We can say, hey, drop every third packet, and let me make sure that my app is like good enough to handle that sort of scenario. So it's really good for developers uh, and folks that are testing. Uh, to have that level of control. But we can also control things like, it's like you have a virtual network there. So we can control like NAT, you know, just like at home, if you have a a home router, um, you know, that's got an IP address and it can share with everything inside of it, inside the home. So we have the ability to do that too and like port forward um, services. So you can have some services running on a bunch of virtual machines and have those port forwarded to the Mac so that you can hit it from outside. And this is how folks run, um, or one way that folks will do like iOS development and things like that, where they have a bunch of Mac OS VMs in behind the network and they can automate it because they've exposed the ports on the virtual machine to the host network. So you can get to it from the outside because you've established a route. Um, so these are just sort of like, you know, stuff that these, you know, the virtual abstraction sort of gets us. Uh, and we've been innovating those over the past years to make them better and, and you know, do more things that our developers are asking for. It's been a while since I've taken a deep look at, at virtual machines. And, yeah, this is quite a bit different. There are a lot more capabilities here than there were before. And, I, and if, again, you know, with, with the Mac that you're running, I mean, this is just so super smooth. Uh, you, know, you feel like I could work all day in this and not, not even notice that I was working in a virtual machine. Yeah, and one of the cool things too is like you can actually also duplicate VMs. So we have this ability to do what's called a clone. Um, so you can take a VM and I can do either a, what's called a full or a linked clone. So this way I can like, you know, it's very similar to Snapshot, except I can run them both at the same time. So I could say like create a linked clone. Oh, it's powered on, sorry. Uh, I have to take this one, say create a linked clone. And what it's going to do is... Um, back is uh, it made a duplicate so now these two are basically the exact same computer the back the exact same configuration um, we can open them both at the same time they'll both run at the same time uh, so it's really handy it's it's just so much more than what it used to be where it's just like hey i need to run windows on my mac it's it's exploded into this uh, really remarkable testing bed and this this we kind of call it like a, a sandbox you know, inside of the sandbox, you can do so many different things, everything you can do with a computer. Um, and and it makes it tricky when we tell about like, well, what can you do with a virtual machine? Well, what can you do with a computer? You can do all of that in a virtual machine, <laughs> you know, but, um, but yeah, it's been, it's been really awesome being a part of this team for the past several years and watching us really, really innovate here and, and, and change how people use their, their computers every day. Absolutely. I, I want. I do want to go back though too, and I believe it was when you were creating the new machine. Um, so let's say that I'm ready. That that, that uh, Catalina comes out tomorrow, and I'm ready and willing and want to update, but I want to keep my options open. So how do I prepare? How do I save or prepare my existing Macintosh hard drive for? loading into a later virtual machine do i image it then it looked like there were images there of, of one kind or another do i clone it to, off to an external hard drive and then am i cloning it back into uh the new virtual machine with something like carbon copy cloner how is how how is I, how should i do, go about that yeah that's the short answer is those aren't workflows that we support um, you know, so what we can do is if you have a Windows machine, we can actually convert that into a virtual machine, but we can't do the same with Apple. Um, so there's no, there's no real good way to like take your existing system, do something to it so that it's offline and then put that offline thing in a virtual machine and then test out how that's going to go with Mac. You can definitely do that with Windows, uh, but not so much with Macintosh, unfortunately, just do some of the challenges that the software presents as well as some of the licensing things that Apple has given to us. So in a scenario like that, what you'd want to do is you could actually install Catalina in in just a virtual machine going through the general installation upgrade process. So the way that it works is when, you know, you get an update notification, um, you know, it pops down and it's like, hey, macOS Catalina is available. 
and you say, go ahead and download it. When it downloads it, it puts this file into your applications folder. And I probably have one on the system here. It's like install Mac OS, you know, beta or whatever. Um, yeah, I, I moved it. But in any case, there's a file. It's like install Mac OS Catalina, right? And all you really need to do is like hit the plus here, new, and then drag that file onto here. We'll detect it, automatically move forward with it. So the story is you can create a virtual machine, test out Catalina, maybe put your apps in it, figure out it works. You can sign in with iCloud and get all of your, you know, your Apple stuff that you've got purchased on your Apple account, get all that working. Um, in a VM, just fine. And then when you're ready to bite the bullet and do it on the host, then you just go ahead and do that. And then, you know, the virtual machine and everything else will just continue to work because, you know, we have the support on the Catalina. So if you go from Mojave to Catalina, all your VMs will continue to work. But at the moment, just to be clear, there's no way for me to take my existing machine, my existing setup and everything and move it over into a virtual machine. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Just, just want to be sure. I mean, yeah, nobody's, nobody's got that one figured out yet. Well, and, and I can, I can certainly understand why for, for lots of reasons. And it's, I'm not even sure it's something I would necessarily want to do. If I really have that need to be able to, to, to go back and work in that environment, I can purchase a, uh, an external uh, hard SSD, clone the mach- clone it over there and boot from that. Um, but that's, yeah. that, that's not something you necessarily want to do. Yeah, it, everyone's appetite for that sort of thing is going to be different, right? I have definitely heard folks being able to do this, you know, carbon copy the thing. And then we do have the ability to create a VM from a raw disk, which is that to say like a hard drive that's got all the right sectors in all the right places with all the right bits um, loaded up. We could do that. And that does sort of work. Uh, but it's just not a workflow that, you know, we think a lot of customers are asking for. So the cuts the, and the work involved in getting that to work is not trivial. Um, you know, when, with, when we did it for, um, for windows, um, you know, we have to install all of our drivers in there first and we have to remove all the existing drivers and then create a copy of it. And then when we run it, um, if there are, there are any of those older drivers there, they could cause kernel panics and, blue screens and things like that. So there's a lot of work that has to go on just to make sure that the OS and the hardware it's going to be in line up. And, uh, and Mac just really makes that hard. Uh, but that being said, I have definitely heard of folks um, having success with it, but it's not something I would, you know, I would run a production system on. I would do, wouldn't do anything more than tinker with something like that. Are you, you're talking about a bit to bit, bit to bit copy of, of the, of the hard drive. That's, yeah, that that would be very interesting to to experiment with, but wow, a uh, little time consuming at the very least. Yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, but like I said, I've heard of folks getting it done. Um, there are there is a variety of like open source tools that can accomplish these sorts of things, but it's not for the faint of heart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Mac Mac admins tend to do this sort of thing. <laughs> yeah, 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 well, they, because they have nothing else to do, right? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> I, I don't. I don't even know what to say because this is so far beyond what uh, my last my last experience with setting up uh, virtual machines is, and and the performance clearly has has skyrocketed. Um, and since this is such a brand new version, what what kind of pricing is there for all this black magic that you guys are uh, able to accomplish? Yeah, sure. Uh, well, we have uh, you know generally there's two products on the Mac. We have Fusion and Fusion Pro. Uh, Fusion Standard is forty nine dollars. Fusion Pro is one hundred and nineteen, um, depending on if you have upgrades or if you're buying brand new versions. And um, the, there's some differences between the two. So I showed off like the virtual networking and I showed off cloning. Uh, those are things that are only available in the Pro uh, player. The regular version has most of the stuff, just not. Uh, some of the more pro features, like it also can't connect to vSphere. So, you know, on the, in the inventory, you can, with a pro product, you can connect to your data center and see all your data center VMs there too. Um, so yeah, and we're also running a promotion right now. So we just did a release and we're offering like 15% or 20% off, depending on which product you want. That's going to be going on for another week or and a half or so. Um, so it's a really good time to upgrade. Like I said, we've extended the support for this version. Uh, to go a little longer than than how we normally do. Typically, what happens is every year we release a .0, and that version is a paid upgrade for everybody. 
Uh, but this year we released 0.5 as a free upgrade to our existing customers. So if you've got you know, 11.0, 11.1, you can install 11.5 for free. And the reason that we did that was because Apple and Microsoft are making it really hard to continue to support their operating systems on a day-to-day -day basis. And by that, I mean it require, it's requiring us and other vendors to really put a lot of extra effort into just working. Um, so, you know, for us, we didn't feel it was appropriate to keep to charge folks for a full upgrade price just to make it just work. You know, Catalina introduces a lot of new security features, um, particularly around code signing and uh, escalation of privilege and things are required to run in user space. And, you know, they're having a hard time with kernel extensions, so they're pushing those further out. And, you know, in order to keep up with that, it's an incredible amount of engineering work. But like I said, it, it doesn't feel right for us to be like, hey, we put all this engineering work into it just to keep it working. You know, please give us the full upgrade price. So we thought it was the right thing to do for our customers to extend the support for the current version, make sure it's going to support the latest and greatest. And at the same time, it just frees us up to be able to innovate on the next big thing for, for next year. And, and anyone that has listened to the show at all knows that I'm, I'm a huge proponent of software developers, be they large or small, getting paid for their efforts because I want you to be around to do those upgrades and keep these solutions running for me so I don't have to go to somebody else and say, hey, how do I solve this problem? Just like we started out with by saying, how do you keep that sewing machine running? How do you keep that roller coaster running? You know, somebody needs to be paid to do those those software upgrades or you're suddenly looking around for solutions like this or having to run whole older dedicated Macs just for one piece of software. So I, I, I applaud you for what you're trying to do for the consumers, but for heaven's sake, you know, make sure that you're, you're able to stick around and keep doing this. Oh, for sure. And, and you know, there's some really great stuff happening in the open source community as well. Uh, the trick is, is, you know, open source is sort of born from a, a need to scratch a particular itch. And, you know, that itch might not be the same itch that you have. Somebody else's, the way that they've solved the problem might not be how you wanted that solved. And that's really where commercial software helps is, you know, we're serving a market. You know, we, we, we believe in more than just trying to capture the revenue. We think that there's a lot of value for particularly our vSphere customers to have, you know, your data center, the whole data center can run on your laptop. And, and gives you this level of interoperability that just doesn't exist anywhere else. And that's really what, you know, we are trying to do behind these products. And, you know, we've gone to great lengths the past couple of years um, to realign our internal development team so that we are on the same, you know, wavelength and the same page as our enterprise team. It's, it's one team now, whereas, you know, a bunch of years ago, it probably wasn't. Um, you know, like they build the stuff over here, then we, you know, put a cool UI on it and make it a product, right? But now we're all one one big thing and it really is doing great for the product because, you know, it's really signaling that we're here to stay. This isn't going anywhere. We're going to continue to innovate and make sure that folks like yourself just have a really great experience with it. Well, on behalf of everyone that's going to use this solution to solve their, their Catalina issue, um, thank you for everything you've done. What is uh, what's the best place to to have people if they have additional questions? Uh, can they contact you? Should they contact VMware Sales or support? What's the best place to send them? Sure, yeah, good question. Um, I'm very accessible. Um, I'm on Twitter as uh, at Mike Roy Soft. Uh, my little joke on the name there, and um, you can also find us in the communities at communities.vmware.com. There's a huge uh, array of folks in there of all types. Uh, eager to answer questions. We monitor the forums and, you know, if there's questions in there that we see that we need to give attention to, we absolutely dive in. Uh, but like I said, I'm very accessible. You know, I'm also behind the, the VMware Fusion and the VMware Workstation Twitter accounts. So, you know, there's a lot of ways to, to reach out to us. And, and like I said, it's, uh, we're there for you guys, the community. Michael, I can't thank you enough. This was uh, a lot more than I'd expected and hoped for, and I feel like has been a good exhaustive review of of not just the solution to the Catalina problem, but also of VMware itself. So, thank you uh, for the time, and I hope you'll come back and show us what what cool new things you're doing when the next release comes out. Oh, can't wait! Thanks, Doc. Sounds good. 
Folks, I'm Chuck Joyner. This is Mac Voices. I hope this has answered some of your questions, gives you one more option uh, when the time comes to upgrade to Catalina and maybe takes a little anxiety away if you have mission critical apps that aren't upgraded yet or maybe that are not going to be upgraded yet. Now you have yet one more option to, to run them with. Until the next time, and as always, thanks for watching. Visit macvoices.com for show notes and to connect with Chuck on social media. Get involved in our Facebook group or like our Facebook page and get more out of your Apple tech with Mac Voices Magazine, free on Flipboard and on the web. And if you find value in it all, consider supporting us through either our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash macvoices or by making a one-time donation via the PayPal link on our front page and in the show notes of each episode you will join these fine people who help bring you Mac Voices. Advertising handled by Backbeat Media at backbeatmedia.com. Bandwidth provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com.